and let them have dominion. A word from Jesus is all you need to read again, to live again. Chains are broken, God is revealed. Praise the leaders to transform the world. Dominion City, raising leaders that transform society. I want you to join me and welcome the president of Intercessors for Africa, Barrister Mekawamba. Give him a big God. With his lovely wife, Mama, please give her a big God blessing. Thank you, sir. Bless you. All right. While we're still standing, let's pray together. Could I ask you to just pray that the Lord will speak to you in the way that you will understand? Let's just pray that prayer. Just pray for yourself and ask the Lord to speak to you in the way that you will understand. And ask the Lord to make your understanding fruitful. Give you understanding as he speaks and make your understanding fruitful. Let's begin to bring our prayers to a close. Our God and our Father, we want to thank you for what you have prepared from the foundation of the world for your people tonight and father we ask that by the anointing and the power of the holy spirit you would rend the heavens that come down and speak with the voice that wakes the dead and make your people hear thank you our god and our father we pray that as we hear you will give us knowledge, you will give us wisdom, you will give us understanding and that you make our understanding fruitful. Thank you, Father. We pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name and everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right, please be seated. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Tonight, I'll be sharing with you exercising authority through the court of heaven exercising authority through the court of heaven now if you look at daniel chapter 7 let's introduce each one of us to the court that sits in heaven in daniel chapter 7 i want to read from verse 9 Daniel chapter 7 verse 9 it says there I watched till thrones were put in place and the ancient of days was seated his garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool his throne was a fiery flame its wheels a burning fire a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him a thousand thousands ministered to him ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him and look at that sentence it says the court was seated and the books were opened there's a court that sits in heaven and in Isaiah chapter 33 verse 22, the Bible tells us that God is judge, his lawgiver, and his king, our king. Not too many of us understand the workings and the role of God as judge. But here very clearly, we're introduced to the court of heaven. 
And you know, in courts down here on earth, judicial processes take place. Cases are pleaded. Verdicts are rendered. People seek reliefs, and where they're right, they obtain those reliefs. Judgments are given, and possibly people are sentenced, bound, and sent to prison. Some are exonerated, and so on. You notice the lawyers do their pleadings, and then make their advocacy. All of these go on in the courts on earth. To a large extent, the same processes go on in the court of heaven. And our own advocate there, 1 John chapter 2 verse 1 tells us, if any man sin, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So we have an advocate in heaven. And we have God as the judge of all men. Notice also that Jesus, in Hebrews chapter 7, we are told he is our intercessor. And he ever lives to make intercessions for us uh, he, who have come to God by him. And he saves us to the uttermost. So, he's an intercessor. He's also our advocate. Now, there is a scripture that I would like us to enter this night's study with. And it is in Matthew chapter 16 in the New Testament. Let's look at Matthew chapter 16. It's a scripture we're all familiar with. But I'd like you to see it in union light tonight. Matthew 16 we're looking at verse 17. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also said to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And look at this verse 19. Whatever version of the Bible that you have, if you have your Bibles open, let's all read verse 19 together. One, two, go. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now notice here, it talks about whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound or is bound in heaven. And whatsoever you lose on earth is loosed in heaven. The language there is judicial language. Before you can bind anything, you would have to discuss it, make a case against it or for it. And when you come to the conclusion that there's something wrong about this fellow, this matter, then the question of binding comes in. Or Conversely, the question of losing comes in. Now, I want you to hold on to that understanding because when Jesus made this promise about the keys of the kingdom, this is the one promise that distinguishes the church from any other group on earth, any set of people, any institution. The keys of the kingdom. Many of us have been believers for many years and we have no idea what the keys of the kingdom mean. And when you check the New Testament, there are quite a few keys there. We'll talk about a few of them tonight, perhaps by the grace of God tomorrow morning. But I want you to understand that this whole question of the keys of the kingdom is judicial in nature. Before you can exercise this key, you've got to run it through the court of heaven. Sometimes it can be an elaborate process. Sometimes it's a matter of a few seconds, a few minutes, like we shall see. But then notice it says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, 
and whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven jesus wants the church wants us to work with him in agreement in synergy in tandem to bind certain things on earth and to lose certain things on earth now notice the language in isaiah chapter 61 isaiah chapter 61 it's a scripture we are familiar with but let's look at the judicial language there we'll soon pick up speed don't worry but let's get the fundamentals right Isaiah 61 we're looking at verse 1 it says the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim notice he says proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound now what was it that went wrong with the people who were bound that made them end up in prison for which they would now have to be brought out normally most prisons you need keys except an angel comes to help you like peter you need keys if somebody has been sentenced to prison the warders i don't know what you call them in other countries the warders have the keys and before they open the door for you to come or the gates for you to come out the courts would have said your sentence is served or somebody would have pardoned you or a court of appeal would have overturned your ver the verdict and they would come with what is called a reproduction warrant a piece of paper that says they can produce you from prison and then the keys can be used to open the door for you to come out now all of this is judicial we cite the scriptures we quote them but the mechanics if you like of getting this done we need to understand there is a judicial process in there notice that this was the first scripture that jesus spoke in luke chapter 4 when he finished with the temptation that uh, the enemy the devil threw against him in the wilderness now having said that it is important for us now to go to the next step and the question is how do we how do i how do we come into this whole picture there is a court in heaven jesus christ is our advocate and the bible says that we are priests and kings and jesus promised to give us the keys of the kingdom now keys are a symbol of authority uh, in the 60s in nigeria we used to have city mayors we had one mayor in port harcourt another one in uh, Enugu, and I think there was one in Lagos then. When the mayor wears his uh, ceremonial robes, there's always a gold chain round about his neck. And in front here, there is a key, which was the sign of authority. That's what they would wear during official or ceremonial processions that showed this man is a man of authority and in the united kingdom they still have that tradition today when the queen is going for the opening of parliament she gets to a particular point where the boundary of the central london where the parliament the house of parliament are located she stops there for a moment the carriage stops and the lord mayor of london ceremonial gives her a key permitting her to enter into the city they still do it till tomorrow and so we notice that the keys of the kingdom speak of authority hello and if you want to exercise the authority that the lord jesus christ has obtained for us 
by reason of his death and resurrection, through prayer and through uh, advocacy in the court of heaven, this is the way to get about it. You can shout, you can wave your arms, you can do whatever. If the judicial process is not done, then you don't make it happen. It doesn't happen. Now, let us look at one story in the Old Testament where this whole question of the court of heaven was uh, manifested. Now, let's go to the book of Isaiah chapter 36. Isaiah chapter 36. If you look at Isaiah chapter 36, you would notice that chapter 36 speaks of an invading army that came and took certain of the cities of Judah. They captured certain of the cities of Judah and then began to lay siege to the city of Jerusalem. They laid a siege against the city of Jerusalem. And the army was very powerful. The army of uh, King Sennacherib. And he had one spokesman. Today you might call him the chief of staff. A man by the name and title of Rabshakeh who came and actually threatened the children of Israel. If you look at that chapter, uh, so many things are said there. We don't have time to go into uh, the whole story, but let's see one or two things that uh, the Rabshakeh said. If you look at verse 11, or let, let's even go back to uh, verse 7. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altar Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar? Now therefore I urge you, give a pledge to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses, if you're able on your part to put riders on them. There's an exclamation mark there at the end of that verse. This is a man who comes and is speaking to the re um, representatives of another nation. And he says, look, this is what we think you are like. If I give you 2,000 horses, can you even put people on them? I mean, that's an insult to the entire nation. Now, Look at this. If you look at uh, verse 10, it says, Have I now come up without, without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said to me, Go up against this land and destroy it. Then Eliakim, Shebna, and Joah said to the Rabshakeh, Look at the language, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. And do not speak to us in Hebrew, in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But the Rabshakeh said, Has my master sent me to your master and to you to speak these words, and not to the men who sit on the wall, who will eat and drink their own waste with you? You see that? Look at the kind of language. Boastful, insultive, denigrating. Then the Rabshakeh stood and called out with a loud voice in Hebrew and said, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. And so on and so forth. Now, this is intimidation this is propaganda this is lying and he shouted to the hearing of the people on the wall to bring down their morale now at the end of the exchange the three men 
Shebna and the other two came back with sand, earth on their heads, their robes torn, and they were in a state. Look at verse 21. But they held their peace and answered him not a word. For the king's commandment was, do not answer him. Then Eliakim, came, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe, and Joab, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of the Rabshakeh. That's the situation that you might face in a nation, in an institution. You might face it in a community. There are people who are very strong, too sure of themselves, and they think you amount to nothing. And physically, there's no comparison. I mean, this man said, look, it's not a question of thinking how strong your army is. The test is, I'll give you 2,000 horses. Just put men on them, that's all. And the man had to plead, please, speak to your servants in Aramaic. We understand the language. Don't speak in Hebrew. And then he even goes on and makes a lot of noise. And the people were cowed down. These were the top government officials sent by the king. And look at them coming back, you know, humiliated. There are people like that. There are situations like that where when you look at the odds, terrible. Now let's go to chapter 37. And so it was when Hezekiah heard it that he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. Tore his clothes, grief, humility, sackcloth, repentance. Grief, humility, repentance. And he goes into the house of the Lord. Now, this time he sends this man again. Let us, for the sake of using uh, technical terms, he briefs his three officials and sends them to their prophetic advocate, Isaiah. And Isaiah takes the matter to the court of the Lord. Did you hear what I just said? Good. And these three men, therefore, we can call them applicants in this case. Now when he says, thus says his God, this is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy, for the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God will hear the words of the Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to reproach the living God. Now, this, there is something here which I'd like you to take note of. And it is this. This was a situation that Hezekiah was facing with all his people and officials, the entire city of Jerusalem. But he found a way of dragging God into it. How did he do it? The complaint was the words that they spoke. It's not really that they came to insult us. They came to reproach you, the living God. Did you, did you hear what I just said? Yes. You have to bring God's interest into it. You've got to find a way that this affects the interest, the name, the person of God. Now, notice that they came to Isaiah in verse 5 and Isaiah said to them Isaiah received an answer thus you shall say to your master thus says the Lord do not be afraid of the words which you have heard with the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me so God accepted their plea surely I will send the spirit upon him and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. So God gave a judgment. And he said, I had the words which they used to blaspheme me. I'll send the spirit against him. He will go back to his own land. That was not enough. Because the Rabshakeh, you know, ramped up everything. And he returned. 
and found his king had gone, you know, facing another army, and he now went into what today you might call ranting. R A N T. The man began to rant and say so many things, which we don't have time tonight to examine. When you go home, please uh, read that. He question he says have the gods of so and so stopped my master and all of that you know and then he got to one particular sentence and he said do not allow god even deceive you ha that was too much now he wrote a letter look at verse 14 look at verse 14 and Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and did what? Spread it before the Lord. Everybody say, spread it before the Lord. Let's say it again, spread it before the Lord. This is important. Now, second hearing, if you like, second hearing. First, Rabshakeh, Sennacherib, God said, I've heard the words with which they reproached me. They're not going to enter into this city. By the way they came, they'll go back. Rabshakeh says no. And began to say a few more things. And then put them in writing. And Hezekiah received the letter, read it. It was too much. That letter... He brought the letter to the temple, to the court of God, and brought it as documentary evidence before the Lord. Hello? Sometimes you've got to bring documentary evidence before the Lord when you're pleading a case. Now, look at how Hezekiah did it and Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it and Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord then Hezekiah prayed to the Lord saying O Lord of hosts God of Israel the one who dwells between the cherubim you are God you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth you have made heaven and earth now look at verse 17 let's all read verse 17 together one to go incline your ear O lord and hear open your eyes O lord and see and hear all the words of sennacherib which he has sent to reproach the living god now hold it you see hezekiah brings this exhibit and he brings it before the lord documentary of exhibit and he says lord i'm introducing this letter in evidence and i want you to read it and i want you to hear the words that proceed from that document and then he makes an admission but then he makes a distinction he makes an admission but he makes a distinction this is important now look at verse 18 this admission is truly lord the kings of assyria have laid waste all the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire but then the distinction is for they were not gods but the work of men's hands wood and stone therefore they destroyed them yes i agree with a bit of their boasting they destroyed some uh, idols and all that they were not you know they're just the works of the hands of men wood and stone and all of that they're not you're different from them now listen when you bring a matter before god you're facing odds that are too heavy too much for you if the enemy has any accusation against you or makes a statement which is true admit it say yes it is true but this bit is not true you make a distinction which is what he did here you see because let me say this don't just deny everything 
Jesus said, if your adversary, you know, has accused you, agree quickly with him on the way so that, you know, he does not get you into court and you're found guilty and you're bound and thrown into prison. The spiritual application to that is this. If there is anything Satan can accuse you of, uh, Pastor David was speaking about sins some minutes ago and various levels of backsliding, level of consecration that's gone down, things that God does not allow, has not allowed for you, to which you have gone back, agree before you come to the court of God. Agree, say yes, admit, and then confess those sins and bring repentance. Hello, are you with me? This is important. Don't go talking to the devil when he can point at something in your life and tell God the reason why you will not, you can't listen to this man or grant him the reliefs he wants is because of this, this, and this. Search your heart. Prepare yourself. If there is any point where the enemy can honestly and truthfully accuse you and you're guilty, admit it before the Lord. Don't forget, we have an advocate with the Father and we have a heavenly high priest. Say amen, somebody. Amen. So, this man here says, truly, they've done this, this, and this, but those gods are just wood and stone. They're not God. Now, look at verse 20. Now, therefore, O Lord our God, look at the reliefs that he is asking God for in his submission. Now, therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, number one. Number two, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord, you alone. Again, he brings God's interest into the matter, the matter of God's name. You see, yes, save us from his hand, but don't forget your name needs to be known in all the kingdoms of the earth that you are God alone, you alone. That's important. Don't forget that principle. Now, if you look at the rest of the story, Isaiah, who represented them in that court, begins to give them the prophetic lowdown of God's judgment. I don't want us to go into all the details, but let's quickly go to verse 33. Verse 33. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, look at the judgment that God gave. I mean, this sounds like something out of a judge's book. He shall not come into this city, number one, nor shoot an arrow there, number two, nor come before it with shield, number three, nor build a siege mound against it, number four. By the way he came, by the same shall he return, number five, and he shall not come into this city, number six. Says the Lord, for I will defend this city to save it for my own name's sake and for my servant David's sake. Say amen, somebody. You see, God gives the judgment, seven-point judgment. Now, notice, God brought into the judgment an element that was not even asked for. And he says, for my servant David's sake. Now, there are certain foundations, quote-unquote, on which you can stand. If, for example, you come from a nation where certain of the church fathers had, and you know it is authentic, they have entered into a covenant with God, or they've covenanted the land to the Lord, or covenanted that institution to the Lord, or covenanted whatever it is to the Lord, you can stand on that. Because God had respect for the covenant that he made with David. And he cited that covenant and he said, the reason I'm going to do this is not just because you asked, 
but also for my servant David's uh, sake. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Now, look at the execution of the judgment. We're looking at verse 36. Look at the execution. Then the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of Assyrians. All right, let's all read verse 36 together. Everybody, one, two, go. Then the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when the people arose early in the morning, there were corpses all dead. Full stop there. Now, let me ask you. An army that couldn't produce 2,000 men to put on 2,000 horses, how would they have been able to kill 185,000? I'm asking you. Is that going to be possible? No. So, even in the physical, if Sennacher, I mean, if uh, Hezekiah and his army were even to go and get a victory of sorts, they couldn't kill 185,000. Some nations don't have armies as large as this. And an angel, just one, did this job overnight. Just, like, just 185,000 one night. And it happened because Hezekiah and his top officials went to the court of heaven. This was not on the battlefield. They got the victory in the court of heaven and God executed this uh, judgment. Now, the second part is even much more interesting. Look at this. Verse 37. Let's all read verse 37 together. One, two, go. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away, returned home and remained at Nineveh. Verse 38, everybody. Now it came to pass, as he was worshipping in the house of Nisroch, his God, that his sons Adramelech and Shareza struck him down with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. Then Esarhaddon, his son, reigned in his place. My brothers and sisters, listen. You see, when you look at some of the keys of the kingdom, let's look at one. I'd like you to look with me uh, to the book of Revelation. Revelation. Look at Revelation chapter 3. And we're looking at verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, This thing says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. That's the key of uh, David. Now, there is the key, the keys of death and of hell. Jesus was saying in that scripture, in the book of uh, Revelation, it says that he is the one who has the keys of death and of hell. Now look at me. You see, we who are disciples of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, we have begun to make your presentation. You need to do it in a diligent clear manner normally when you're addressing the judge you don't raise your voice you don't shout you don't get all you know shaken up and all that you don't when joseph was speaking to pharaoh in egypt the day he was given the interpretation of the dream now if joseph had begun to shake blah 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 blah, blah what would Pharaoh have said? Get this madman out of this place. Hello? If he was shaking and dancing on one leg and the other. No, no, no. He did it. He stood there, spoke very clearly, wasn't speaking in tongues, spoke very clearly in understanding. And by the time he finished, 
Pharaoh had understood, not just understood, accepted what he said, and without an interview, who is your father, where do you come from, have you paid taxes for the last three years, none of those questions. Where shall we find a man who is like this, in whom there is the spirit? I don't know how Pharaoh got to know that the man had the spirit, but he said so and gave him the job. So when you come before the Lord, you take your time. And normally, there'll be about two or three or four or five of you. Sometimes it's better to do it like this group there were four of them five six seven ten but make sure that everybody sanctifies themselves what uh, pastor david was speaking to us uh, before you know i came on it's important because when you're going to meet god when you're going to go into his presence you prepare yourself it's not like you just jump out of somewhere and then you're making all the noises in the world you sanctify yourself, you prepare. You prepare over time. Some of the matters we have had to bring before God, it took us about some two months to get all the facts ready. Do some research, consult some books, cite some articles. Hello, are you listening to me? You bring them. And then you divide up the presentation. Okay, you take this aspect of the matter you take this aspect of the matter you take another aspect of the matter and in a closed environment where there is no distraction you begin to talk you know to the almighty some presentations we've done that five hours five unbroken hours five this day after that another presentation we had to go seven hours and that, that's a long time, isn't it? Seven hours. And you tell the Lord, listen to me, this is important. Because you see, there are problems for which you have prayed, some of you who have been in the prayer movement, 20 years, 30 years, until we began to understand this thing, that some prayers we had prayed for 40 years. But when the Lord began to show us, look, you've got to bring a case. The enemy has some interest. There are some things he's holding on to. And then you come. It just goes like that. The Lord gives you the verdict. In fact, by the Holy Spirit, you have an idea what the outcome is likely to be. Say amen, somebody. You make your presentation. You cite some scriptures. And you remind the Lord of some precedents. You know, some people for whom he had answered those prayers or done those things uh, or dealt with such issues, you know, before then. Now, it's important that you do that. It requires hard work. You may have to even look at the constitution of your country. In one of the cases here, we had to check the constitution, some of the sections. And we had to cite those sections. And we had to ask the Lord to look at the, the fact that the, the, the people we're complaining about or the matters we're complaining about were actually acting contrary to the constitution of the nation. And there are certain scriptures which you could cite either for your case or against the party or the enemy. Now, let me close with a testimony. In 1991, that's a fairly long time, the Intercessors International invited us, because Intercessors for Africa is part of Intercessors International as it used to be constituted. Now it is called International Fellowship of Intercessors. We all met in Nairobi, Kenya and had quite some time of prayer for various things that God was doing in different parts of the world. And at the end of that meeting, some of the leaders, like the late Shel Shobag, who's going to be with the Lord, 
and some of the others decided that we would be sent out in small groups to various nations of the continent to deal with certain hot issues at the time. I remember that one of the issues we dealt with in Kenya was that one of their um, economic trees had caught a disease, an infection, and was affecting all the trees in the nation. And I remember Shel Shobag led us, we all stood, and he read a scripture on healing, and he laid his hands on one of the trees, and we laid our hands on the trees around the conference area, but these trees were all over the nation. And we prayed for the healing of those trees. And you know what? Some weeks after that prayer meeting, all the trees that were diseased in Kenya were healed. Give the Lord a hand if you want to. Okay, that's enough. And there was another prayer point. One particular country, I forget which one it was then, the currency had gone very bad. And we laid hands on the currency and asked the Lord to heal the currency. And the Lord did that. I had to lead the group that was going to Ethiopia. There were seven of us. One gentleman from Tanzania, uh, two from Europe, I forgot which countries now, there were two of us from Nigeria, and then we met our brothers in Addis, seven of us. At the time, Mengistu Haile Mariam was in control of the largest army on the African continent, over 250,000. He had the largest stock of Russian-made weapons. He personally had shot 24 generals on a particular day he was on his way to uh, Zimbabwe and in the air got the information that a coup was being executed. He came took loyal troops, stopped the coup and shot 24 generals. This was the man who was in charge of the place and they had just introduced communism. In Addis at that time it was an offense to walk three abreast. If three of you were walking abreast, you were under arrest. That was how bad it was. Everybody was moving around in fear. Now, we got into this pastor's sitting room. His sitting room, if you were to look at this board and put it on the floor flat, the sitting room wasn't much bigger than that. And the Lord said to me, ask him, who were the people who instituted communism? They gave us three names. Mengistu Haile Mariam, Legese Asfal, and Menelike. And the Lord said, after we had, they had, you know, listed all the things that had happened, and we had, you know, this, listed all these complaints, discussed all of them, and shared them like this. The Lord said, speak into the heavens, and blot out the sound of their voices from the heavens. That was the first time I heard such a thing. And by my spirit, I just got it. And I told them what the Lord had said. And we prayed. We blotted out their voices from the records, from the heavens, the entire cosmos. And the Lord gave us strategy as to how to deal with the matter, to execute the judgment. Two weeks exactly after that session, that civil war that had lasted 30 years came to a stop. Now, listen, please, hold on, hold on, hold on. Later on, when I traveled to Zambia, Lusaka, I, shared, I was sharing this testimony, and one of the men sitting in front said, So, in the middle of our speaking, he said, when you finish preaching, pastor, I'll tell you the rest of your story. I was like, what's going on here? So when, he, when we finished, he added on to the story. He said that when Mengistu's army broke up, 
1,000 soldiers from generals to privates trekked to Kenya and arrived at a place called Tika near Nairobi. And he said that his own younger brother, Dr. Beta Mengist, who was in charge of Living Bibles, East Africa, preached to those 1,000 soldiers. They all repented and gave their lives to Christ and started a Pentecostal church in Tika, Nairobi. And various other things that happened. Now, now, now hold on. Listen. You see, when you take matters to God's court, make sure no exaggerations make sure you're speaking the truth make sure the enemy cannot counteract what you're saying the enemy cannot successfully accuse you because you've already confessed cleansed yourself uh, you know by your confession and the blood of jesus has cleansed you and there is no condemnation in your conscience and and sometimes there was something that pastor uh, David uh, mentioned a little earlier and that would apply to most of you here tonight and it is the question of having to bring repentance for certain iniquities in your family background many times we gloss over that and we quote some scriptures and you know that those scriptures are not true in your life don't play games with your destiny and don't play games with your ability to handle matters like the same and somebody. Now, there are many other testimonies. But tomorrow morning, by the grace of God, we'll take this matter a little further. But as I close tonight, I just want you to remember that Jesus promised us the keys of the kingdom. We have the key of knowledge. The key of the heavenlies, the key of death, the key of hell, and we have the key of David. Each of those keys, supernaturally powerful. Maybe tomorrow, by the grace of God, depending on how the Holy Spirit leads us, we might discuss one or two of them. But I've just given you a taste of how the thing can function. You see, this key, I talked about the keys of death and of hell, we used it in that prayer to deal with the covenants that Mengistu and his friends had made. The authority of an entire government, the destiny of an entire army, and the destiny of an entire nation. Take note of that. Please stand. Let's pray. Stand to your feet. Let's pray. Let's pray. Please bow your heads. Our Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the privilege you have given us tonight to share your word. And I'm asking, Lord, that the word we have read from the scriptures will take hold of your people. And Lord, that you will water this word and give the increase. And let there be fruit. Like Jesus said, some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold. So that your name will be glorified. And Lord, tonight, begin to give us an understanding of how to exercise authority by the keys of the kingdom in coming to your court in heaven. Thank you, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. This is the end of this part. Please play the next tape in the series.